Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of Well-Tempered Bernadette, a piano's tale of five cities. I'm your host, Valerie Duick. I'm a classical pianist, and I move around the globe with my trusty Hello, piano, everyone, and Bernadette. To episode two of Well-Tempered Bernadette, a piano's tale of five cities. For a second here while I figure out what's going on. I may be dead. There we go. That's working. Thanks for waiting, everybody. So the theme of this series is about movement. We're exploring what it's like to move to new cities, how to navigate culture shock, and why it's so important to build new communities wherever you are in the world especially in the field of music. Today, we're going to talk about Bernadette's move from Ottawa to the city of Nur Sultan. You might be wondering, where is Nur Sultan? Well, it's in Kazakhstan in the region of Siberia. And Nur Sultan received its new name in March of 2019. Before that, it was called Astana, which means capital city in Kazakh. Astana became the capital in 1997 of Kazakhstan. And today we're going to be using the name Astana to refer to Nur Sultan to recount our experiences of the time. In our last episode, Bernadette was in Vienna. She was receiving her VIP spa treatments and even on the way home, she got the deluxe treatment of a specially built crate built to measure, so well built. My piano tuner from Ottawa and mover, Troy Scarf, he told me that when she arrived in Ottawa, the piano tuners were so excited. They were casting lots because this crate was so well built. They said, you could have sent Bernadette to the moon in that thing. Well, in retrospect, I should have been a bit better prepared that moving a piano from Vienna a place that is rich with classical music tradition to a place like Kazakhstan where traditional classical instruments are more likely to be carried on horseback because of the, no, no, the nomadic Kazakh culture. I should have been prepared for those distances. As a musician moving to a new country, I was about to learn that things that were easy and straightforward in one city might not be the same in the next. And I needed to learn to be flexible so that I could adapt when things inevitably got a little bit frustrating. I arrived in Astana from Ottawa in November of 2010. Bernadette arrived half a year later. It turns out that Bernadette was going to have an epic world odyssey in order to get to her new destination. I flew over the Atlantic Ocean to get to Kazakhstan, and I expected that Bernadette would follow a similar trajectory. And so we spent months looking for her to dock in Riga when finally I realized that she had not gone over the Atlantic Ocean. She'd gone down the East Coast of North America through the Panama Canal and out over the Pacific Ocean, ending up in the beautiful port city of Qingdao, in China. Qingdao is the place where they make that beer. So I'm wondering if maybe Bernadette has a bit of a wild streak in her after all. Once we found her, we got her boarded on a train to Kazakhstan, but it wasn't long before there was another bump in the road. You see, Bernadette didn't have her passport and I didn't even know that she needed one. So we got that sorted and finally she was on our doorstep at our apartment building. Well, the reunion was delayed again because after the piano movers dropped her from the third time from the truck, we sent them away. Two weeks later, they were back with an expert. And at this point, I was a bit skeptical about the movers because I had seen one of them at our apartment fixing the shower just the week before. But 
in the city, it was still so uncommon to move a piano. It was the first time for most of them to do it. Well, all that was left was to get Bernadette up to the third floor. It was the last leg of her journey. And they had the crate taken off. They had some cozy blankets wrapped around her to prevent any more bumps. And she was on her dolly. And so I'm not an expert, but I've seen pianos moved a few times and I do know that the fastest way, if you've got wide straight stairs to go up, is to just take the stairway and it should be over after not too long. But for whatever reason, they decided it would be better to take the elevator. So after four hours of maneuvering, getting all 12 of them into the elevator, along with Bernadette, they finally made it into our apartment. And amazingly, when the big reveal happened, although she had some scars from her travels and also from falling off of that truck, her soundboard was still intact. It was amazing. So my guests today, they can empathize with what that might be like as Phoebe and Adam are pianists themselves and they thrive on building community wherever they go. Um, they're joining us from their home in Hopeman in the region of Murray in Scotland. So Phoebe and Adam, we're so excited to have you here to talk about Kazakhstan today. Hello. Hi. 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 Good evening. It's Thanks great for coming. So I wanted to take a moment to remind our movers, our movers, I'm seeing the chat here, our viewers, that if you would like to write a little note for Phoebe and Adam, maybe you wanna know what it's like for musicians to live in the region of Siberia, just jot it down in the chat and for sure, let us know where in the world you're watching from. We'd love to see that. So Adam, you're a violist and a pianist and you play a lot of other instruments because you like to collect them from yeah. whichever place you're living in. You uh, play regularly with a folk band called the Boatshed Band, and you also play with the Highland Chamber Orchestra called the Mahler Players. So Adam, you moved to Kazakhstan in order to work at the music department of Haleybury in Almaty. I'd love for you to share with us about your journey and how you got there. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I started my first job in Kazakhstan out of um, out of university. And yeah, it was a bit it was quite as exciting as um, Bernadette's move as well, although we didn't go round and round the globe. Um, decided to go out rather than plane because the school the school sorted transport by plane. And me and a couple of other friends who were starting the same job um, decided to go by train instead. My parents are from Hungary. And so we got the night train from Budapest to Moscow. And then it would have been the five day sleeper train from Moscow all the way down into Almaty, which is the old capital, which is where the where the school was. And on the third day, I think it was um, it was it was summer and it was around the time when swine flu was happening and the other other passengers in the train, because we were living in the big sort of open compartment. They, they knew we were British and it turns out somebody called the doctors onto the train because they were concerned for us. Now, cultural um, misunderstandings, we didn't know that in Kazakhstan, it's actually really bad manners to blow your nose in public. And we didn't know that and it's quite hot on the train and so some of our noses were running. And so the train pulled in at the station and the doctors came on board and they had, I remember they had little red flags on the side of the carriage and they took our temperatures and looked into our eyes with lights and eventually they said, uh, you, you will come with us to me. And I remember getting off the train, they took me off the train, had my viola with me. I left my suitcase on because I thought, okay, that's, that'll be fine, but I need my viola. And then the train started moving and off it went. And I didn't know what city I was in. They took me in, in an ambulance um, to the nearest hospital and kept me in solitary confinement for two days. I had, I remember I didn't speak any Russian. I had this little 1960s phrase book of Russian that I took with me and I searched for the phrase that said, I have a job. I need to go and the doctors would sort of peer at me through the through the glass and give a little smile and a little laugh and then disappear and um, yeah that was it was a little bit stressful actually but after after two days they let me go and said okay you've got nothing wrong and and they had the sort of decency to pay for a taxi from the hospital but into the nearest city which I now know is Aktivia 
And I remember wandering around the city my first time in Kazakhstan because it, I hadn't got off the train since Moscow looking for a pair of shoes to buy because I was still in my train slippers from the train. <laughs> Went up to the cash machine and put the card in it said, would you like to withdraw 2,000 tenge or 200,000 tenge? And I thought, I'm like, I have no idea. Anyway, then got in touch with the school and um, Aktivir is about it's almost 2,000 kilometers away from Astana. So the school, Almaty. If I, sorry, from Almaty, that's right. And the school paid for my flight. And then I arrived at school two days late. Um, the upside being I, I would have had a little legend around me when I when I arrived to start the job, but <laughs> that was Absolutely. my entrance into, yeah, into Kazakhstan. Wow, what an amazing introduction <laughs> to, <laughs> I bet you learned so much in those two days that you yeah, were it's sort maybe of, planning it, on learning. Yeah, it, set, it sets one up for the sort of adventures that you have. We had lots of adventures in, in this fantastic country. It was a really exciting, dynamic place to live. And although that was a little bit stressful, it did show that you had to be prepared for absolutely everything. Um, yeah, we both found that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, incredible. Well, it's, it's a, also kind of a, a shocking reminder that we do have to be aware of how we're coming off to other people too, right? I mean, the, the things that we might be doing and seeing as natural could actually come off as frightening to other people. I think that's that's an incredible, incredible story. So Phoebe, you arrived a year later, also to Almaty to head the music department at Haley Berry. And Phoebe is a wonderful singer and pianist and choral conductor. She does all sorts of things as well. Excellent music educator. And uh, she loves to use music to create new communities around herself everywhere she goes. Phoebe, I'm hoping that you chose a bit of a more sensible route to uh, end up in Almaty. How did you get there? Yeah, I don't have an exciting story at all. Not like Bernadette or Adam. I just, <laughs> I got on a plane in London and flew to Almaty and that was it. And I arrived in the middle of the night and was met by, I went with lots of other teachers who were also going. So I immediately had this little group of friends, which was great. And we met the headmaster and Adam was there to meet his friend. And that was the first time I ever saw him. And uh, that was it. Not a very exciting story. You mean well. love at first sight, surely? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. Maybe if it wasn't love at first sight, it did progress over the course of time. And by the time I met you guys, I think you maybe were in love. I had come down to Almaty to uh, to play or to adjudicate for a piano festival that you had coordinated, Phoebe. And um, then shortly after that, I think it was two years after you arrived, you guys were married, if I remember correctly? Or Yes, or that's you... right. So we, we, were, we both lived in Almaty first, and then um, Adam moved to Astana, and then I moved there two years later. So, but that was a great piano festival that you came to adjudicate. It was a really special experience <laughs> it to have really a, was. A, um, a real amazing concert pianist like you, Valerie, sharing your expertise with all our hordes of little pianists there that we had in the school. In the yeah. school wasn't yeah it was it was a really special experience for me too and I was so impressed at the level of playing as well and that's when I first met Malika Richards as well mm -hmm. when we started to play together later on in Astana too so then two years later you're both in Astana in a new city again how did it feel moving to the capital city and were there any things that surprised you about that move um, I suppose the most surprising thing for me was how new the city was and how, um, I don't know, it had, it had this air of like optimism about it and that things would change almost on a weekly, monthly basis. You would, you would fly away on holiday and by the time you came back, you were driving down streets with buildings that didn't exist before, such was the rate of change. And it, it meant that people could, could do things in the city and it meant we, we, we managed to do a lot of concerts with locals in the city and um, yeah, just sort of make connections with people who, who, are, up, who, who are up for doing things and, and creating things from scratch as the city was growing as well. That, I think that's, that's the thing that surprised me most because I'd no, never lived in a place like that. All the mm. cities in Britain, if you think about the big, big, big cities, if there's any development, it's little bits here and there and it takes a long time and here they were adding 
sections, neighborhoods to the city really, really quickly. Yeah, that's right. It was still a pretty young capital city by the time we got there. And so much of the city was developing. I remember for me, it was really surprising how to discover that I felt isolated there because I remember going, I mean, it is in an isolated location, but you're in the middle of a big city. But I went up to the top of the Baiterek Tower with the big globe and the spokes all sticking yeah. out and, and looking around the whole city and then just seeing the end of it. And then all around the city was step. It and now I imagine scary, the city has grown it? even more to, to fill in that space, but I actually was surprised that I was terrified. And I yeah. thought, how can I be terrified? I'm a prairie girl. I'm from the middle of the prairies where everything is flat and cold and there's no trees. And, and here I, I finally realized, well, this is a really, this is a different situation. This is, this is an isolated situation. What surprised me the most about that was that isolation could breed a, a feeling of isolation. I just assumed that isolation would breed a sense of community because everyone was in the same place in the similar um, circumstance. But yeah, what really surprised me was that I had to be deliberate about getting out into the culture and making connections and creating new, new friends and in, in every aspect so that I wouldn't feel isolated in, in, the, in different ways than I was expecting. So again, it was a, for me, it was another lesson in not quite being prepared for what that would be like. So Phoebe, you just, I think, as I recall, you just jumped in and, and created another musical community around yourself in a sense. Well, I think, the, um, I think you're right that it can be very disorientating moving to somewhere like Astana because especially Astana is kind of this, um, at the beginning, it was quite a sort of fake environment that people were all being moved to from their companies and from their countries. So it wasn't a kind of organically built community. And so you had to... I felt like you had to work quite hard to kind of make a sense of community there. And um, what well, we had a community choir in the school that we did lots with, and we played chamber music every week with our friend Christian Badetz, who's a violinist. And that, that was a great connector that we then were able to play at different events and meet more people and um, yeah, just kind of build a community. But I think you're right, in Almaty, it was easier. There was a lot more people there. and a lot of stuff happening um, in a kind of more natural way. Whereas in Astana, you had to make it happen. But mm. as Adam said, there were also the opportunities to make it happen um, mm. if you took them. So, and it meant you could do things sort of your own way or a new, new way of doing things. Whereas in Almaty, it felt like, especially the music scene, scene was very ingrained. It had been a sort of, um, it, it used to be the Soviet music system and everything was done in a particular way. and. You have to do your concert programs in this particular font and use this particular wording and things. It was it was like that. Whereas in Astana, it felt a little bit more free, and you could you could experiment with things. Um, what kind of what kind of freedoms did you notice? Um, I, think, <laughs> I think you could have ideas. You you could say things like, "Let's do a concert." Doing we for example, there was a great concert of um, English music, yeah. and our friend Ross Clark, who's the kind of person that makes things happen, he. He flew out a friend from uh, a tenor from Wales and we did this brilliant collaboration with a local choir. And I think it would have been harder to do that in Almaty or definitely I think it would have been harder to do it in the UK because people tend to be busier here and more yeah. things are planned a lot further in advance. Whereas in Kazakhstan, there was a sense of like, oh, let's just all get together and put this thing together and we can do this and we can do that and we'll make it happen. And which I was quite exciting. It was only about a week after we did that concert and the concert organizers said, okay, that went really well. Do you want to do, do you want to go on tour to Karaganda next week? It was that sort of time scale. We thought, okay, quickly ring around the choir and everybody, yeah, okay, let's do let's it. Go to Karaganda. And then we went to Karaganda, which is, was it 500? I don't know is how it, far it is. About, about it's another city kilometers. in Kazakhstan. Yeah, it's near. It, it's it's, it's still quite the journey to get there if you're, yeah. if you're gonna drive for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's so neat. So yeah, so all of these different, you know, this this time to be, to react a little bit more quickly. I wonder if that has something to do with, because the, the city was newer and, and, and was reacting to its own environment. I mean, it, like you mentioned already, Adam, the 
the city was being built so quickly. Mm. The um, all yeah, of the, I think, all of I the think buildings. So. There, there was just I think everyone worked at a different pace. And yeah. we really noticed that when we moved back to the UK after living there, that it felt like everything had to be so planned so far in advance. And it mm -hmm. felt really slow compared to how things worked in Astana. You know, it was just a very different pace of life. That was a bit of reverse culture shock. Yeah, definitely. I think we felt when we moved, well, back, I suppose it was back to the UK. But for me, Scotland is a different, I've not lived in Scotland before, Phoebe's the Scottish one, but there was definitely an element of like reverse culture shock. But we had to try and live in a kind of curious way and try and deliberately keep um, that sense of uh, opportunity happening. And yeah. um, we've managed to meet lots of great musicians around here and got involved in things, which has helped. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you mentioned before too that it was like when you when you go into Kazakhstan or when you were in Astana and you'd go away maybe for a holiday or going back home a little bit and then you'd get back and there was like a new building or several buildings that you hadn't even seen because the, the pace of life was actually really, really fast there. So when you first got there, Adam, because you arrived a year before Phoebe did, did you find that, how did you access the Kazakh music and culture that was there already? How did you do that? Um, well, it was, I was really interested to, to find out more about the music and, and because I, Kazakhstan was the country I knew, well, hardly anything um, about before I went out there. And it's really interesting from a musical point of view because it has these two systems of music. You have the old, the, the sort of classical tradition, which was even before the Soviet era, it's, it's, it's been there and people um, go to music school and they get trained up and there's lots of pianists and amazing orchestras. And in each, in every big town, you would expect to have a ballet house and a concert hall and they play, it's really interesting to, to hear all the Russian music um, being played being played there so they, you have that tradition and also the Kazakhs have their folk music tradition with completely different instruments like the dombra um, I can see you've got your dombra behind you on the piano brilliant joining Bernadette <laughs> and they've got other really interesting <laughs> instruments as well and their music is really harmonious actually as well they they, they have beautiful, beautiful melodies music, yeah. and it's accompanied with with harmonies that we can understand the rhythms are really interesting because sometimes you've got irregular time signatures. There's a lot of singing. So there's um, a lot of really strong lot, folk yeah. singing tradition. There's, amazing mm, folk singing. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of music going on in the city, and you can pretty much find in both cities really a concert going on most days a week of some sort of music. So you you just have to ask. Um, we had fantastic teaching assistants. And shout out to Leila, my former teaching assistant and Kazakh um, music expert, who we went on tour with to Hong Kong. But she, 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 for example, would always say, OK, Adam, there's this concert coming up or that concert coming up. So we had the opportunity to go out and, and experience this music, often for really, really cheap as well. The mm -hmm. tickets were, were, were really cheap to go and to go and watch it. Yeah. So when I was there and I wasn't there as long as you guys were, but when I first arrived in Astana, a lot of these in Western classical music infrastructures weren't actually in the city yet. So I don't think there was a concert hall or not the one that there is now. And um, also the opera house wasn't finished yet by the time by the time I left. So did you find that even in the course of the next couple of years, your your options for going to see music, both like Western classical music and traditional Kazakh music, did that did those options start to open up or were you just more aware of what was there? I think they, they started to open up a lot. I think um, in the time that we were there, the, they developed a, a much bigger program of international visiting international artists. And we've seen some amazing um, performers in Astana and the opera house finished and it was, they had strong connections with Italy and they would bring over lots of the, their whole sets, amazing sets for mm. Madame Butterfly and um, really, really top quality performances we saw there. Was, you know, amazing music. The Astana was really trying to make itself a, an international, um, an international hub for classical music, and it was brilliant to see that happening and to give people opportunities to see world class performances that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So, how did these exposures um, affect you guys as musicians? 
It was great. I loved it. Yeah, it, <laughs> I made, loved it made us raise our game. Yeah. We thought, right. Okay. This. This. Yeah. <laughs> when you see when you see world class music being done really well, it's just it's inspirational. We we were lucky enough with our school now to take a tour of um, thirteen children from uh, from, from Gordonston, where we work. Yes, yeah, yeah. where we work, and we took a tour back to Kazakhstan to Almaty and Astana. And as part of the tour, we um, we saw La Bohème in the Astana Opera. And afterwards, one of our one of our former friends there, he, he was a trombonist in the pit, and he took the children round backstage and onto the stage. And you could see these children on the music tour just thinking, wow, this is amazing. And they were really inspired to, to have seen a performance like that and then to be backstage and meet the musicians and see all the inner, inner workings of an opera, opera house. I think that's that, that's an experience that all sort of young musicians need to, to inspire mm -hmm. them. I love it. And it's so true that the when the higher quality that we're listening to, the more inspired we feel, right? It's just, yeah. it, it feeds us back in that cycle. So now you guys are in another new home. You're in Scotland. Adam, this is the, your first time living there. And Phoebe, you're still sort of far away from home, three hours away from where you used to live. And you've been connecting to a new community. I saw your live Kaylee on Facebook, which was That's so great. great. So nice to see you reaching out during these times in that in that way. Um, so what's coming up for you guys on your horizons? I think um, we're trying to keep our eyes open for opportunities for anything that comes along. It was so great to get in touch with you and to be doing this. And I think actually the whole lockdown process has made us kind of rethink about doing music more and um, the thing we've missed most is doing live music. It's just not the same without it, you know? And um, we miss playing with our Kaylee band, the Boat Shed band. We usually play with them every week. So it's been very strange not to have that. And, yeah. and same with our community choir that we run. It's been a very strange thing not to have that annual, that, that weekly meeting on a Monday night. So I really hope that sometime soon we can get back to doing that. Yeah, there's so much uncertainty right now. and. Um, it's true that there's there's just no replacement for for the live music, though we're going to try today. <laughs> um, we're going to have Adam play uh, the Dombra for us. I'm so excited. And I'd love it, Phoebe, if you could just introduce the instrument, because um, I think it's a pretty special instrument. You can tell us also what PC is about to play. Yeah, so this is this Dombra was made for Adam and um, it's made by a, a first class Dombra maker from Kazakhstan that I met. We agreed to meet on a little street corner and he drew a little picture on a scrap of paper and said, do you want me to design something like this? And so it was he, a present from Phoebe. So I, I was you can see, <laughs> there's two there's two horses running across the step and this is a little yurt with the smoke coming up with the traditional Kazakh tent. And then. Um, and yeah, two weeks later, he brought it back. We met on the same street corner and he handed it over. So it's a, it's a really beautiful instrument. And he said, the most important thing is that you replace the strings with American fishing nylon, nothing else. That is what not, you must not use. Not Russian, not Chinese. It has to be American, has to be American fishing American, the nylon. finest quality. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So Adam's going to play a, a piece called Yerka Silkum, which is, it's kind of a love song. Um, it's about a man who's remembering a girl that he was in love with and wasn't able to marry. And so he picks up his Dombra to play and all his feelings come out into the Dombra. And as he's playing, he's thinking about, he's comparing her to the full moon and the flowers. And it becomes a sort of portrait for how beautiful all Kazakh women are, which is true. They are very beautiful. So this is Yerka Silkim. I'm going to move out of the way. <laughs>
that was so wonderful. Well, I've I'm never so done an impressed. Dombra, bef Dombra performance before. That was quite fun. <laughs> that was fantastic. What? <laughs> tell you. me about the little feather on the end of it. Okay, so that's um, so. Uh, Kazakh people are, are quite spiritual and there's so before they're, they're now um, there's a lot of Muslims now in the country but before there's a lot of shamanism and there's still sort of those, those beliefs around so this is to ward off evil spirits it's for it's for good luck it's yeah to for the evil spirits to be warded off so it's traditional to have to have the feathers on the dombra. Also when they do performances they quite often flick the flick the neck of the dombra and the, the feathers kind of dance in a yeah, a lot beautiful of, way to watch. A well. lot of folk music performance is very theatrical, and they have a lot of emphasis on the actual performance as well. So sometimes dombra dombra players will sort of be playing and then pretend to take the music in their hands and manage to play with one hand, and then throw the music to another player, and they'll be playing, and or they spin the dombra around, and it's 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 a great example of how to really perform in any type of music. Really, it's yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's like watching music dancing right yes. like it's, if if music was dance it's how how it would look um i did post a video of that on my facebook page because i think it's just so cool to watch them kind of passing the music between each other with these these special movements and then often only playing with one hand right yeah, the other yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's really cool well we have a few comments here from the chat that i'm just going to go to so i'm seeing here we have a friend called Kaz Adventures. I know who that is. That's my friend that I met in Kazakhstan. And she's talking about the, she said the best Astana performance was Bernadette, which is true, <laughs> uh, me and Malika, who we've mentioned already, the Malika Richards, who was in both Almaty and Astana at the same time as you guys were. Uh, that was a real treat doing those performances together with, with Bernadette. And we did it right in my apartment. So we had we had several performances throughout that year. Um, we've got uh, Heather Goulet saying hello to Bernadette and friends, Hayden Kiefer from the Adirondacks, and uh, Judy Kaler Siebert watching from Winnipeg in Canada. So that's what I thought Astana would be like, but it was much colder. <laughs> <laughs> so it was minus 40 before the wind was taken into account, right? Um, I have a nice question here. Does, does the government actively support music in Kazakhstan? It's a great question. Um, it was very well funded. As, as I mentioned before, every sort of larger town had a opera house and a ballet theater. And I think that came from the Soviet system where it was, it was all just uh, supported in, when the, uh, with the government. And so what we found was a lot of the children went to music school after they went to normal school, then they went to the government paid for the music school and they learned theory and they learned how to read music and they learned the piano or other instruments. So you had a very strong uh, musical tradition and people respected musicians as well. It was, it was really great. Uh, and, and it was sort of equal between folk music yeah. and classical music. I think you, they were both taken really seriously. I think it's some, Places you have to fight for folk music to be taken as seriously as classical music, or vice versa. But I think in Kazakhstan it was, yeah. for from our perception anyway, it felt like they were both really strong traditions that were supported, and that was were a really strong part of their culture. Too. And sometimes you had concerts that were sort of mixed, didn't you? So yeah. Mixed folk music, or um, yeah, mixed classical music and mixed folk music. Oh, that's wonderful. So a few more comments here. Greetings from the Netherlands and grateful thanks for your wonderful Dombra performance already coming in. So thank you so much, guys. I just have one more question for you. And that is, if you could perform anywhere in the world, <laughs> where would that be? That's a brilliant question. Um, that is a really good question. It's really hard to answer, but I... I, oh. I know what you might say. Okay, well, I'm gonna say it and then you can see if it's right. Okay, but, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what, where we live now in the north of Scotland, there are just loads of big, open, wide, sweeping beaches, and they're just the best place to stand and sing, because often there's nobody else around. And it'd be great to take a piano, to take Bernadette to a beach in the north of Scotland, 
and play and sing some music there. Okay. Let them, you no, thought no. That. I thought you'd say great. mountain. You thought you'd say a mountain. I thought you'd say a mountain. Okay, mountain so Ellsbury mountain Park. or the you sea. You love to mountain. hike. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I also love the sea. There's yeah. something special about the sea. For me, with the Boat Shed Band, I've been sort of trying to push the idea for a number of years now that we should be doing a, a gig in Findhorn Bay. So Findhorn is a, is a village on the, um, on the Murray Coast where we live, and it's got a beautiful bay that's tidal. But if you get if you work out the tides right, we could have a pontoon and a boat or perform there, or maybe each of the band members perform in a different boat. And unfortunately, we've not we've not managed to make it work. Um, there was one year where Phoebe learned the double bass and to get around the piano problem, because how would you put a piano in a boat? Um, so, but unfortunately, we had to get we had a double bass, but we had to give it a, give it back to um, the person we borrowed it from. But maybe if Phoebe picks up the double bass as well, we can realize that dream and actually <laughs> perform as the boat shed band in a boat or many different <laughs> boats. That that would that would be great. Just as the sun's going down, the people could dance on the beach or join us in boats as well. That would be mine. <laughs> what a beautiful <laughs> image! I love it, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me today on the show and for joining Bernadette. It's been so great chatting with you and hearing about your um, experiences in Kazakhstan. And I just really appreciate that you took the time to share with us today. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having thank us. It's, it's been wonderful to talk about great it. Great to reconnect. It's and really great to positive. remember all the really special things about the Kazakh period of our lives. Yeah, yeah beautiful, beautiful. And thank you also to Ivan Plazacic, who's our digital advisor, making all the behind the scenes magic happen. And also, I guess I should say thanks again to my wonderful co-host, Bernadette. She did a great job today. That brings us to the end of episode two. And we've got three more great shows coming up this summer. Up next, it is Joyce El Khoury soprano and world traveler. She's performed all around the world, like the Royal Opera House at the Met and Toronto's own um, Canadian Opera Company. Joyce and I recently met up in St. Gallen here in Switzerland when she was performing Imogen from Bellini's Il Pirata to rave reviews. So we're going to reconnect on Saturday, July 25th. That's in two weeks. I hope you'll join me then. The link will be on my uh, website at www.valerieduick.com or you can check it out on Facebook or on Instagram. And please, if you had a great time today, like and share with all your friends that you think would like to meet Bernadette too. Thank you so much to all of you viewers from all around the world joining us together to have this special time, this special reminiscence of Kazakhstan. And until next time, I'd like to invite you to stay tuned and stay well-tempered. See you soon.